Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Dr. Peter Adamson. He is Professor of Philosophy at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich and at King's College London. He has written articles, monographs and edited books mostly on, the phil on philosophy in the Islamic world and ancient philosophy. He is the host of the weekly podcast History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps, which by 2014 had more than 4 million downloads and led to the publication of a book series. He received the Philip Lever Ulm Prize in 2003 for outstanding research achievements of young scholars of distinction and promise ba based in UK institutions and also received the grant from the same institution in 2010. So Dr. Adamson, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's really a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for having me, Ricardo. It's a great pleasure to be on. Okay, great. So uh, I've also invited you because uh, I've been following your podcast for some time now. I'm not sure how many years, but it was very appealing to me because there were parts of philosophy or the history of philosophy that, uh, to be honest, I wasn't really aware of, particularly philosophy in the Islamic world and in Africa, for example. Uh, so, uh, and I invited you to, for us to talk a little bit today about the pre-Socratics or what people usually call the pre-Socratics, right? Because I guess, as we're going to see, it's a bit of a contentious uh, term, I guess. Uh, so, perhaps my first question would be, um, what should we call philosophy or what is the correct defi definition of philosophy? Because I guess that whenever we talk about its history, we usually position its origins uh, around Miletus in Turkey, in ancient Turkey, right? Uh, but uh, um, I mean, with uh, since you've been studying philosophy from other places in the world, uh, would there be any chance that what we got first from Thales in Miletus was already influenced by something that came before it or not? Yeah, well, okay, so that we could probably talk a whole, for a whole hour about the things you just said. Um, I mean, maybe to, to start with the last thing you asked, one thing that I came to see as a mistake in my own podcast series is exactly that I started with Thales of Miletus, who is usually reckoned as the first pre-Socratic philosopher. As you say, that's also a maybe a tricky term, but he's the first philosopher to write in Greek. And um, maybe, by the way, we should say there that to talk about Thales writing in Greek is a bit of an exaggeration. We just have a couple of short reports about things he might have said, but he spoke Greek. Um, so the reason I came to think of that as a mistake is that I eventually realized that um, if you want to understand early Greek philosophy, really should set the kind of context for that by talking about philosophy in other ancient Mediterranean cultures. And at a minimum here, you can think about Babylonian culture and ancient Egyptian culture. So th this is actually something that I had the opportunity to redress on the podcast because when Chike Jeffers and I started doing this uh, uh, series of episodes about Africana philosophy, mm -hmm. we began by doing philosophy in Egypt and we even had an episode about Babylonia to give context for Egypt. So I eventually got back to doing that. And I mean, the, the reason you might want to do that is that some of the things that are characteristic of early Greek philosophy can already be found in Babylonian and Egyptian culture, in particular, interest in the physical sciences, in mathematics, and also in ethics. So you have a lot of ethical literature, also political literature in both the Babylonian tradition. So you might think of the Tale of Gilgamesh, for example, mm -hmm. in Egypt. There are a whole bunch of works that are really pretty clearly just philosophical dialogues. For example, a father and a son having a conversation about the right way to live, where the father sort of gives the son some traditional advice and the son pushes back against that. So I actually think the, um, 
the right way to start telling the story of Greek uh, of Greek philosophy or philosophy in Europe would be to start by looking at the Middle Eastern context. And that's how I would do it now if I were doing it over again. Mm-hmm. Um, but another thing that you kind of obliquely referred to there is that philosophy doesn't really only begin in the ancient Mediterranean. It also begins at least in ancient India and ancient China independently. And this is a much discussed fact that around the time of, say, Socrates, you also have the Buddha in India, you have Confucius in China, but even those figures are not the first philosophers in those cultures. The Buddha actually is coming along as a philosophical critic of a pre-existing philosophical and religious tradition, which is rooted in the Vedas. Mm -hmm. And Confucius is also not the very first person to have philosophical thoughts in China. Um, In the Africana series, we actually argued even more broadly than that, that probably you have philosophy just wherever you have humans. And it may be pretty difficult, depending on your historical information, archaeology, textual traditions, or lack thereof, it may be difficult to figure out what the philosophical views of a certain group of people were. But I think it's likely that philosophy is just part of the human condition. And so the contrast is more like between highly articulate written traditions of philosophy, which is what you get in China, India, and also Greece, and cultures where you don't have these traditions of writing like Africa or Aboriginal culture in Australia or Native American culture. But I don't, I don't think it's a reasonable view that the Aztecs or the Incans or the Native Americans lacked philosophy. Um, in fact, we have a lot of evidence that they did have philosophy. Mm-hmm. But that's where we get into the question, what is really philosophy about, right? Because, I mean, we could say that maybe whenever people think about uh, anything related to life or to existence or to the nature of reality or even when they invent gods or they think about how, sh- how should they deal with other people and things like that. I mean, are they already doing philosophy or do we need, do we need to do it at a professional level? Yeah, that's a great question. And of course, in a way, it's the question. But because it's such a central question, it's also very difficult to answer. Um, I mean, I I usually take the view here that if there is textual or even material culture, uh, if there's textual material or material culture available from a culture and I can present it to someone and show that it's philosophically interesting, that's kind of good enough. And getting, in a way, I think getting hung up on the question of whether something is or is not philosophy is kind of unhelpful because it leads you into this rather unproductive and ultimately fruitless attempt to police the boundaries between philosophy and other enterprises. So something you mentioned in your question is that you might think, well, when people start thinking about the gods or God, that might be philosophy, a sign that they're doing philosophy. But of course, a lot of people would say, well, no, that's religion, that's theology. And there you're already getting into a very tricky area, because if you start trying to tease apart philosophy and theology or religion, as if the two things were mutually exclusive, then you start winding up with absurd thing views like Aquinas was not a philosopher, right? right because he was a theologian, which to me just seems like a sort of sufficiently crazy thing to say that if if you're committed to that view it just shows you made a mistake early on so my my um kind of general attitude is that we have a sense of certain central philosophical questions like what is the right way to live what kinds of things exist do we have free will what is knowledge? How do we know anything? Do we in fact know anything? Every, do we know anything? <laughs> what are the limits of our knowledge? Um, et, et cetera, et cetera. And these are recognizably philosophical questions. And so to me, what the historian of philosophy should be trying to do is not uh, sort of sort out the cultural productions of the world into the things that count as philosophy and the things that don't count as philosophy, but to go into each culture looking for their answers to these questions, right? And so in a way, it's kind of circular, right, in the sense that you start out with a sense of what would be a philosophical topic, Mm 
and you go into the culture of looking for their way of addressing that topic. But at the same time, looking at these other cultures might also broaden your sense of what could be a philosophical topic. So for example, if you look at ancient Indian philosophy, you see that they spend a lot of time thinking about the nature and efficacy of ritual. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to really get deeply into at least Vedic Indian philosophy without wrapping your mind around the problems that they see around ritual. Mm -hmm. uh, because for them, ritual is kind of the paradigmatic example of a human activity that has a point and has some kind of set of rules. So, so it's like they're, in a way, a central example of um, human behavior that has normative guidelines, which for us might be very strange. Mm -hmm. But once you've seen that, then you might start to think, oh, well, actually, questions about ritual could also be central questions of philosophy, which is a, a, a kind of question you wouldn't have started out looking for. But because it's so closely related to questions you did start out looking for, like how to live, um, what is, how does the motivation of an action relate to the action, and so on, that really it's in talking about ritual that, that they talk about those issues. And so I think that there's a kind of give and take where you maybe start out with some sense of what the core philosophical questions are. You look in each culture for their answers to those questions. And as you do that, maybe your sense of what the philosophical questions are is modified to some extent, but you still kind of hold on to the core. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to a certain point there, when you refer to us trying to make a strict separation, for example, between religion and philosophy, uh, one of the things that came to my mind was uh, basically European medieval philosophy, because I, I guess that it, it would be very hard for us to say then that virtually anyone that was doing philosophy uh, during the medieval time was a real philosopher if we are to exclude religion from it, because basically all of them as far as I know, at least in Europe, uh, we're starting from uh, a religious standpoint and then all the rest that they fought about and they fought about basically everything, including ethics, epistemology, metaphysics and all of that basically branched out of that religious background, but basically was just to give them a basis to think about all of those things that we tend to associate with philosophy, right? Yeah, that's right. And it, But I mean, of course, that's like a great example of the way that philosophy and religion come together. Mm -hmm. But I think that it can be misleading to focus on the example of medieval Europe, mm -hmm. because it might suggest that that's the exception. But actually, that's the rule. So if you look back over the whole history of philosophy, we, we are in a misleading situation because the last, let's say, 100, 200 years of philosophy have been increasingly dominated by atheism. Right. Right. But that's like a very unusual situation in the history of philosophy. So um, if you think, for example, about late antique philosophy, before we get to the medieval period, you basically have two kinds of philosophers. You have deeply Christian philosophers and you have deeply pagan philosophers, but there are no atheists, right? right? In fact, there aren't even any philosophers between the third and let's say the sixth century AD mm -hmm. in late antiquity who aren't in some way strongly motivated by religion. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could argue that maybe Plotinus, who's was in the third century, started Neoplatonism or earlier on Aristotle they don't seem to be um, anti-religious exactly, but religion is not what's driving their philosophy. But even that's pretty unusual. So um, if you think about the, the importance of uh, religious belief in figures in the Islamic world, in early modern philosophy, like even Descartes or Kant, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you cannot understand Kant without understanding Protestant Christianity, right? or philosophers of the, um, of the Renaissance, they, it's a really um, something I always like to say is that every culture produces philosophers who more or less represent the values of that culture. And we kind of expect philosophers to critique the values of their culture, and they do that as well. But they almost always, to a significant extent, also adopt and defend the values of their culture. 
so religious societies produce religious philosophers and most societies in most times and places including today have been religious so i think there's actually it's a very dangerous assumption to think that religion and philosophy are somehow mutually exclusive because in fact what you see in the history of philosophy is that they almost always come together in some way Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even uh, atheist philosophers, I mean, they do a lot of commentary on the philosophy of religion, so it's not that if someone is saying that God doesn't exist, that they are not commenting on religion anyways. Right? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess you could have a more subtle uh, view along these lines where you say, well, if a philosopher is motivated by religious belief as opposed to being motivated mm-hmm. by pure reason or something like that, right. then they're not doing philosophy. But I reject that for two reasons. One is, again, you're actually chucking out 95% of the history of philosophy <laughs> because 95% of philosophers have been in some way motivated by their religious concerns. Not to say that that was necessarily their primary concern, mm-hmm. but it, it's always, almost always a, a factor. And the other thing is that it seems, I think the reason people are tempted to say that is that they have kind of been raised in this post-enlightenment culture where they think of reason and religion as being strongly opposed. But actually, as far as I'm concerned, religion is just one of the many things that motivates and shapes people's worldviews. So you could think about something like um, economics or, or the fact that these, I mean, suppose that I said, well, I don't want to count someone as a philosopher if their worldview is some, in some way in shape, shaped by their being the economic elite. Okay, well, now I can throw out 99% of philosophy, right? right. But being shaped by, by having an economically elitist position mm-hmm. is at least as much of a, uh, has at least as much of an impact on your motives, intuitions, arguments you're willing to ex- take seriously or throw out out of, out of hand as your religious beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And in fact, um, you know, if if you you could say that medieval philosophy from that point of view is a lot less distorted than ancient philosophy because ancient philosophy is perhaps less religiously committed, but it's much more economically committed because most of the ancient philosophers that we know about come from like the top Mm -hmm. 0.01% of the society in terms of wealth and status. And that's not true of medieval philosophy because a lot of those guys are just monks, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so let's get now into the pre-Socratics. I've already alluded to this question earlier, but uh, does it make sense in any way to really have this term uh, pre-Socratics or pre-Socratic philosophy? Does it make sense from a chronological view? Does it make sense from a strict philosophical viewpoint? Because uh, were they doing something when it comes to philosophy that was that that uh, that drastically different from what Socrates and the others that came after him were doing back then? Yeah, so I, I think there's... a oh, you can sort of see why we use the word. So for one thing, it just helps students and other people keep things clear. So there's some philosophers, and then there's Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, right? Mm-hmm. And they're kind of the, the core of ancient philosophy. And so you, you want to have some way of referring to these earlier guys. And they are all guys, by the way. Um, at least we don't have any extant works by female philosophers before uh, Plato. Um, so that kind of makes sense you immediately run into a problem um, if you take it seriously as a chronological designation because actually some of the last pre-Socratics, like Democritus, for example, are contemporaneous with Socrates. Mm -hmm. So they're they're pre-Socratic, maybe in mood, but not in time, right? Right. Uh, So in a way, you might already say, well, this this looks quite problematic. Maybe we should just talk about early Greek philosophy, which is, in fact, what most people are doing now. So the term is, seems to be, so, like, when people uh, put out books on it these days, they usually say early Greek philosophy, not pre-Socratic philosophy. I'm, at least that's my sense. Um, if you wanted to make a case for doing it nonetheless, what you could perhaps say is that Socrates does begin a new 
trend in philosophy by demanding that we use rational argument to critique and defend the way that we live. Whereas that's not a primary topic in some or other early Greek philosophers or even most early other early Greek philosophers. For example, Parmenides doesn't seem to have a lot to say about that. It doesn't work perfectly because Heraclitus, for example, has some fragments that are about ethics and Democritus wrote about ethics as well. So this idea that Socrates kind of invented the idea of uh, doing philosophy with a strong ethical component, that's not really true. Um, so I think in the end, you can sort of, like I say, you can sort of see why it might be a useful phrase, but it's probably not the best language to use. Although I think I used it in the podcast just because I figured people wouldn't have an easier way of seeing what I was talking about. Right. But, I mean, the pre-Socratics, as we call them, they were using reason to tackle other sorts of questions, probably not ones that had to do with ethics, but, I mean, other sorts of questions like metaphysical ones, epistemological ones, right? I mean, Socrates didn't invent the the approach by reason to philosophy, let's say. Right. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, uh, the idea that people, uh, that led people to call the pre-Socratics philosophers would have been that they, unlike some of the other people in this culture, let's say, like politicians and poets and sophists, they would have been the ones who were using reason, following it wherever it leads, trying to answer all these questions, actually, in, in, especially in natural philosophy, like, um, you know, how did the cosmos come to be? What kinds of constituents is the cosmos made of? And, uh, and try to also trying to explain more specific natural phenomena, like, say, rainbows or storms. Mm -hmm. So um, you get a lot of that in the early Greek philosophers. Uh, but you also get metaphysics, as you said, you get epistemology, you also get critique of traditional religion, so there's a famous fragment of Xenophanes where he says that if animals had hands, they would make images of gods that look like the animals, whereas we make images of gods that look like humans. Uh, so, you know, there is a kind of uh, rough and ready intuition that people have, which is that early these early Greek philosophers do indeed count as philosophers because they're the first people to kind of follow reason as opposed to something else. Um, now, whether that's actually right is another matter, but that that's the idea. That's the idea of picking them out as philosophers. Mm -hmm. And are there any common themes that run through the philosophy that the pre-Socratics were producing that we could use to characterize them and to distinguish them from the others that came after. So you referred to applying reason to ethics in the case of Socrates. You gave that an, as an example. Would you say that th there were any big philosophical issues that the pre-Socratics were particularly interested in and that perhaps would characterize them? Well, it certainly looks like there are, yeah. Uh, but here we should maybe issue a warning about the nature of the material we're dealing with. We don't actually have surviving books by these early Greek thinkers. What we have is reports and quotations from them in later authors, especially Aristotle, and people commenting on Aristotle. And then also, for example, Christian authors give us additional information. A lot of this uh, textual material is actually written down very, very far after these philosophers were alive. So you might wonder how accurate it is. On the other hand, some of it is in poetry or in poetic form, which should reassure you that it's probably accurate or at least fairly accurate um, and so on. So there's a lot of problems about that. But um, that's relevant to your question in part because when Aristotle presents these early Greek thinkers, he picks out themes that are running themes in their output. Mm -hmm. For example, in the beginning of his book, The Physics, he says, well, philosophers for a long time have been trying to figure out how many principles there are. So the word principle is archae, 
So it could mean like beginning, causal principle, explanatory principle, something like that. And then he just sort of goes through all of what he would think think of as not the pre-Socratics, but the pre-Aristotelians. And he kind of categorizes them in terms of how many principles they accept. So for example, you know, Empedocles has four principles because he's got four elements. Or the atomists have an infinite number of principles because they believe in an infinite number of atoms. Parmenides is a monist. In other words, he believes the whole universe is one thing. So he's only got one principle and so on. And uh, that means, so what the effect of that is that it means modern day scholars can easily be tempted to just kind of follow Aristotle in his way of dividing up the terrain of early Greek philosophy and taking his word for it about what the main themes are and main concerns are. And my feeling here would be that he's a somewhat reliable witness, but not entirely reliable because he's trying to set up his own discussion. So really, the, like, that's a good example, actually, because the point of that whole chunk of the physics is that he wants to get to his answer to the que question, how many principles there are. So it's really his question. It's not their question. And he's sort of forcing them all into this framework of how many principles, right? And yet it does seem that one of the things the pre-Socratics were doing was trying to find a small number of explanatory principles that they could use to account for the entire universe. So all the phenomena that we see. And a good example of this would be trying to reduce everything in the universe to the states of some small number of material elements. So this is something that um, Aristotle really emphasizes is that the earliest pre-Socratics all kind of choose a, an element out of which everything is made. So Thales supposedly makes everything out of water. Um, Anaximenes makes everything out of air. Heraclitus thinks fire is the most important element. Empedocles has all four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. The atomists have their atoms and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be an example of a theme. But if, of course, it may just kind of look like that because that's the way Aristotle sets it up and he's the source of information for most of these guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally speaking, could we say that they were doing naturalist philosophy in any way? I mean, were they interested in um, observing natural phenomena and documenting them or at least using them to make their philosophy? I mean, I, I, of course, they probably weren't um, doing any sort of uh, empirical science as we have it now, but could we call them naturalists? Yeah, well, actually, it may even be that they were doing natural science to some extent the way we would think about it. So if, if you go back to what I was saying about Babylonia and Egypt, already there you have very well-established traditions of astronomy and other forms of mathematics. And it looks like Thales is coming in on top of that. So he also uh, knows something about astronomy, supposedly. And there's a famous story about him um, predicting astronomical events and also events down here on Earth that are um, influenced by the heavens. There's this legend about him knowing that there's going to be a big harvest of olives and buying all the olive oil presses to... Um, corner the market on being able to make olive oil once the bumper crop of olives comes in. And he just does this to prove that you can use science to make lots of money. And then he says, okay, now I've proven it. I'll go back to being a philosopher because I don't care about being rich. So, so, I mean, you can believe that or not, but it, it's the, it sort of, con sort of conveys the idea that these thinkers were actually, in some cases at least, paying a lot of attention to the physical world. Mm. But you're right that they don't do experiments using the scientific method, for example. And in fact, a lot of their, uh, a lot of the accounts that they present of the natural world have the form of what we might think of as analogy or metaphor even. So like this idea, for example, that air might be a very important principle seems in some sense to just come from the fact that living things have to breathe right, as humans and animals at least have to breathe, so that air is somehow keeping us alive. And that would maybe push you towards thinking that air must be a very important principle in the entire universe, right? Um, or again, 
why would you think fire is the most important element? Well, because living things are all warm, mm -hmm. right? Um, so like any animal you can put your hand on, you'll feel that it's warmer than its environments or almost any animal. So uh, the thought might be, well, they kind of start by looking at some specially favored example, like an uh, animal or other some organism, and then they kind of blow up using analogy from that small thing to the whole universe and try to understand everything using the same kind of principle. Mm -hmm. So they were observing nature, they were taking some observations from nature and natural phenomena, but perhaps ultimately they were not sticking with what they, um, they could grasp with their senses, let's say, or trying to um, strictly do something empirical with that knowledge but they were extrapolating and saying that perhaps they were there were some uh, invisible elements or principles working yeah. there that, that people didn't necessarily have direct access to and that's perhaps uh, one way by which they differ from modern scientists yeah, although um, here we should also say that the pre-Socratics are not all the same in this respect because Parmenides and his followers, the Eleatics, they are well known for arguing in a way that has nothing to do with sense experience. So when Parmenides proves that all being is one, mm -hmm. the arguments he gives there are actually designed to use reason to overthrow the deliverances of sense experience because of course you wouldn't look around the world and think that everything was one right, right. so i mean that the arguments he gives result in the conclusion that all of being is one homogeneous sphere mm -hmm. with no differentiation within it at all and nothing beyond it so no apparently no empty space outside it and clearly you'd have a hard time getting that out of sense experience so you get it instead out of a, a this kind of series of rational arguments or um his followers, Zeno and Melissus, also use use arguments to establish monism. So pe people who are listening to this may have heard of Zeno's paradoxes. And these are supposed to show that the very idea of motion will get you into various contradictions. So like this idea, the famous paradox that you can't move because to perform any motion, you first have to perform half the motion. And before you can do that, you have to perform half of half the motion and before you can do that, you have to perform half of half of half of the motion. And since that would lead you to having to perform an infinite number of tasks to perform any motion, motion is impossible. Uh, so again, there, that's, there's that example with Achilles and the turtle, right? Or yes, exactly. Like yeah, or Achilles and the tortoise, where Achilles can't. It's very similar. So the idea is Achilles is running in a race with a tortoise. The tortoise has a head start, and Achilles cannot catch him because whenever Achilles gets to the place the tortoise just was a moment ago, the tortoise must have moved on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Achilles will move to that point where the tortoise is now, but again, the tortoise will have moved on. So Achilles has to move to the place where he is now, but the tortoise will again have moved on by the time he does that. So how it doesn't matter how much faster Achilles is than the tortoise, he'll never catch the tortoise. So like leaving aside the question of whether these are good arguments, the point is that they're not empirical arguments. They're like logical puzzles or thought experiments, which are designed to support a philosophical theory that's maybe something more like metaphysics than natural science or natural philosophy. And if anything, is supposed to tell you not to believe your senses. And another example, by the way, is the atomists. So we think of atomism as a well-founded, empirically-based theory of science. But actually, as Democritus pointed out, in a way, atomism in, the, in antiquity, at least, was supposed to undermine the senses. So he has this, um, this line, by, sen by convention sweet, by convention bitter, but in reality, atoms and void, or something, something to that effect. So the idea is that the sensible properties of things are in some sense at least not the fundamental properties of things because what's really there is just atoms and void and so you should uh use reason to kind of correct your sense impressions of the way the world is mm -hmm.
So, among the pre-Socratics, we also tend to include the Sophists, right? And I, uh, as far as I remember, uh, philosophers like Plato and Aristotle really had bad opinions, to say the least, about what the Sophists were doing. So, but, uh, I mean, were they right in some way? Was it really the case that what they were doing, the Sophists, that it was really that different from philosophy or at least the sense that uh, Plato and Aristotle, for example, had of philosophy. Yeah, I mean, traditionally, the Sophists uh, probably are not actually considered to be pre-Socratic. So there's, a, I would say there's been a change in the field here, because nowadays people, especially, and this is maybe another reason, by the way, to shift from talking about pre-Socratics to early Greek philosophers, right? So early Greek philosophers could include, sounds more like it could include the Sophists, and a lot of the interesting sophists are contemporaries of Socrates, which is why Plato was plausibly able to write dialogues in which Socrates is talking to sophists like Protagoras and Gorgias, right? So they're not before Socrates, they're his contemporaries. Now, what Plato and also Aristotle tell us about the sophists is that they are not philosophers. It's really important that they're not philosophers because they use reason and words to trick people or at best to just convince them of things rather than to find out the truth. So a philosopher is someone who loves wisdom, right? A sophist, I mean, the word sophist comes from the same Greek as the, the uh, word philosophy, right? The sophi part in philosophy comes from sophia, which means wisdom. The sophists are wise men, right? And until Plato and Aristotle came along, the idea was, well, these are wise men because they will teach you how to give a good speech in the Athenian assembly, and this will make you a politically powerful person because you'll be able to get the, de the democratic assembly to vote your way. Um, they might also be able to teach you other things like the way the world is or the right way to live and so on. Um, it's, uh, there's actually some unclarity here about to what extent the sophists posed as teachers of virtue. So for example, um, Gorgias in one of, uh, in, in some of our evidence about Gorgias, um, he explicitly says, no, I don't do that. I just teach you how to give persuasive speeches. But Plato in one dialogue ha has him say, oh yeah, if you want to know how to be virtuous, I can teach you that too, even though mostly I'm a teacher of rhetoric. But I think that the core idea to hold on to with the sophists is really not the idea of like giving bad arguments, which is really what we think of sophistry as, like bad argumentation. Um, and maybe also not anything about whether they're teachers of ethics, but really the core idea of the sophists is that they're specialists in rhetoric. So they can teach you how to construct words into a persuasive discourse. And you can see why a philosopher might find that a kind of disturbing but also ap appealing mm -hmm. uh, prospect because on the one hand, philosophers are also in the business of constructing persuasive discourse. Right. On the other hand, they want to insist that their discourse isn't merely persuasive. It also somehow leads to the truth or even proves the truth. And so both Plato and Aristotle were very concerned to kind of um, move away from the merely persuasive and get to something that was something more like demonstrative, like a actual proof, as opposed to just something where you listen to the speech and you think, yeah, that sounds right. And yet Aristotle also wrote a work called The Rhetoric where he analyzes persuasive speech making. So it's a very complicated thing. They both have very complicated views and uh, attitudes towards the sophists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I guess that in another way, we could also have another approach to what the sophists were doing, because if they were able to create speeches, for example, that would be able to convince people more easily of anything that they wanted to convince them about, then in a sense, we could also uh, take some value, value out of that knowledge, because it could even tell, yous, uh, tell us uh, how our minds work, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, we could know through that uh, 
uh, what people pay more attention to uh, and things like that, for example. Yeah, a great example of that would actually be Aristotle's book, The Rhetoric, because that has one of his most elaborate discussions of the human emotions. And the reason it has that is because he's explaining how rhetoricians play on people's emotions to get them to believe certain things, right? And he's not really sort of saying whether this is a bad or a good thing. He's just saying, if you want to be a good rhetorician, you have to know how to do this. So here's how emotions work. Um, now, I actually think it's an exaggeration to think of that as a philosophical inquiry of the emotions. But that doesn't change the fact that if you want to know what Aristotle has to say about the emotions, you must absolutely read the rhetoric. It's his most interesting discussion of that topic, in fact. Um, or another example would be obviously Plato who is constantly worrying about the rhetoricians. And so when he talks about rhetoric as mere persuasion, that leads him in very quickly into questions about things like moral relativism. Because if the sophists are coming along, like Protagoras in particular, is coming along and saying, well, whatever you think is true, I can help you argue for it or whatever you think is right, I can help you persuade the other people that it's right, then w what kind of project is that if we assume that there is in fact a right thing and a wrong thing? So surely you don't, surely you don't want to be training people to argue for the wrong decision, either in either pragmatic or moral terms. And I guess that Plato thought, well, the reason why the sophists thought you could have this sort of all-purpose rhetorical tool is that they were moral relativists or even moral anti-realists. They thought that whatever what's right for you is what's right for you, and you can argue for it. And you can, you can argue for it using our tools. Whereas Plato wanted to say, well, hold on a second. Uh, you know, an acceptable discourse about what's right and wrong is always going to be the one that establishes what is really right as opposed to what is really wrong. And of course, all the better if it does so persuasively. But the most important thing is that it tells you what's right and not what's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I guess that, uh, and perhaps uh, this will be the, the last question, or maybe after this I may, I may do another one, but uh, another thing here that we should talk about is the ancient poets, because we talked earlier about what is really philosophy about and what we should call philosophy. I mean, if people are simply thinking about the topics that pop up that pop up uh, regularly in philosophy like what is the meaning of life and what is existence about and how we should deal with other people if that is really if they are doing philosophy or not really so uh, but the ancient philosophers were also bashed by people like Plato, uh, uh, but what would you say about that? Do you think that we should consider them as people that were doing philosophy, but perhaps presented it e in another way? For example, some of the pre-Socratics were, uh, were also writing in a form of poetry as that was really close to what the artists were doing. So what, what is your take on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it goes back to something I mentioned before, which is that, especially until recently, people tended to take their cue from Aristotle when they were conceptualizing the intellectual terrain of Greek thought before Aristotle. And so they took from him the idea that there are these guys, the early philosophers, and these are the pre-Socratics, and this is Thales, the other Milesians, Heraclitus, Parmenides, the other Eleatics, the Atomists, Anaxagoras, and Pedocles. That's basically who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Pythagoras, maybe. Some other characters, but those are the main figures. And he definitely doesn't include the poets in that list. Um, so he does refer to the poets, but he doesn't seem to think of them as doing the same kind of thing as what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, by the poets here... We might mean a whole range of people, including, of course, uh, people who write tragedies and comedies, so other literary figures, or Simonides who wrote poems, but primarily we're thinking of Hesiod and Homer. Mm -hmm. So 
um, Aristotle really distinguishes those two things, philosophy, or even those three things, philosophy, sophistry, and poetry, or at least the epic poets. Plato, to some extent, the same. So Plato obviously engages with the so-called pre-Socratics in a way differently than he does with Homer and Hesiod. Nonetheless, it's worth emphasizing that both Aristotle and Plato engage with the epic poets quite a lot, as you would expect, because Homer and Hesiod in Greek culture are sort of like the Bible in medieval European culture. So they're just the text everyone's read or heard, at least since they were children. Everyone knows quotations from these poems off the top of their heads, um, and everyone has heard the stories and so on. So now the question of how we should think about these texts as historians of philosophy is an interesting one. I would say that these might fall into the category of what I was describing before as material that addresses philosophical questions and is therefore worthy of our consideration, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'd want to call it philosophy as a, in terms of like genre, right? Mm -hmm. So Hesiod in particular is telling you about, so he's got this one, one of his two main poems is called the Theogony, so the generation of the gods, and it looks in a lot of ways, very much like a pre-Socratic account of the cosmos, right? You have all these principles, they are gods, but some of the gods have names that sound like natural phenomena, like Oranos, the heaven, um, or chaos, whatever that is. Um, and it sounds like he's giving you a kind of uh, an account of how the universe was produced by the interaction of these principles. Mm -hmm. So at first blush, it looks quite like He's doing something along the lines of what the pre-Socratics were doing. It's also noteworthy that the pre-Socratics criticize Hesiod and Homer as if Hesiod and Homer are rivals or are somehow relevant competitors of theirs. And that's really something that goes all the way up to Plato. So this idea of competing with Hesiod or competing with Homer, that's something that drives Plato in a lot of his works as well. So I think that um, a kind of minimal view of this is that you, if you're a historian of Greek philosophy, you need to know Homer and Hesiod pretty well, because otherwise there, you just don't know about something that the philosophers are always thinking about and have in their bones, having, like I said, heard about it from childhood. A maximal view would be, well, actually, you should just take the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Theogony as being further philosophical works from the early Greek period. That might be going a little bit far, but I would say that they are certainly texts that can be read by the History of, historian of philosopher, oh, sorry, the historian of philosophy, with an eye to the philosophical themes in those works, the way you might do with Shakespeare. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, okay. So one last question, maybe. Um, earlier we were talking about uh, naturalist philosophy, and we referred to some of the differences between. Um, for example, what the pre-Socratics were doing and what modern empirical scientists do. So how do you look at the relationship between philosophy and science? Because there are people that say um, that uh, 500 years ago or so that eventually f uh, science split, uh, split off from philosophy and now it's a completely different thing, but nowadays we still also have philosophy of science and philosophy of the different branches of science. And uh, I would say, the, this is a personal take of mine, and you can comment on that, that science ultimately is a form of epistemology. I mean, we are acquiring knowledge about mm -hmm. the, world, the world, but the way we do it uh, I mean, we are starting from an epistemological point of view that really if we approach things this way by acquiring data and by following the scientific method, formulating hypotheses, testing them empirically and validating them or not, and then going back and starting the process again, that we can really know what the world is about and how it works, but ultimately we have to accept that as an epistemology, right? So uh, what would you say about that? Uh, and uh, do you think that 
science and philosophy nowadays at least really are two different things that operate independently of one another. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the, as you said, there's this kind of almost cliche that, uh, oh, well, philosophers used to not distinguish philosophy and science, but as since, let's say, the Enlightenment, they do, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, that has a lot of truth to it. At least it's very striking if you look back at the history of not only European philosophy, but also philosophy in the Islamic world. It's very striking that a lot of the people who write works that are just uncontentious examples of philosophy are also scientists. But even here, it, we have to note that um, not all sciences are equal in this regard. So, for example, we might think of engineering, like uh, so something like using systems of levers and pulleys to lift weights, right? We might think of that as science, but very, very few philosophers, if any philosophers, were practicing engineers. Mm -hmm. However, many philosophers were practicing doctors, right. uh, especially in the Islamic world. And in fact, they seem to think that um, the transmission of Greek philosophy and science is just kind of all one big thing. And sometimes they even use the word falsafa to refer to all of this Greek intellectual stuff that they had translated into Arabic. And the list of philosophers from the Islamic world who were also doctors is a very long one. Um, also, uh, a lot of philosophers, although not as many as with the doctors, a lot of philosophers do either astronomy or astrology. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that in, in some ways, asking about science in general might be a little bit too broad a question. We might actually need to break it down into particular sciences, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and probably the science that is most strongly associated with, uh, with philosophy and history is, is medicine. Uh, Aristotle is interested in medicine. He does anatomical dissections of animals, right? So zoology, medicine, that's pretty closely related. You have Galen in late antiquity who wrote a whole work called That the Best Doctor is Also a Philosopher. Um, you can go all the way then up to someone like Descartes who's doing both philosophy and medicine. So th there's a very, very strong association between philosophy and medicine, but less strong in the case of some other sciences. Um, I mean, I think you're right that with the advent of the scientific method, there's an increasing tendency of science and philosophy then to pull apart. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, philosophy just gets defined as whatever is left when you're inquiring into the world and you're not doing it using science, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, a lot of philosophers nowadays see themselves still as being closely allied with science because they think that part of their job might be to help scientists engage in a little bit of conceptual clarification of what they're doing, maybe even design experiments, right. use empirical evidence to investigate things like the philosophy of mind or the philosophy of free will, uh, and so on. So, so even now, when we sort of have this disciplinary boundary between the sciences and philosophy, I think that the gap between them is not nearly as wide as you might think. And in fact, a lot of philosophers are trained in science and engaging with scientists. Uh, so really, like from the pre-Socratics down to now, what you really have is this very complicated kind of interplay between philosophy and the empirical science sciences where a lot of the time the people who are doing both things are the same people so the same person is both a doctor and a philosopher both an astronomer and a philosopher and so on mm -hmm. so uh, you gave some examples of situations where nowadays philosophy can aid science in a sense but maybe there are still uh, questions that we care about, particularly the ones having to do with human life, that fall completely off the domain of science, or at least that science can't really solve. Like, for example, one obvious example is the one of ethics, right? Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I, I think that's right. Or at least a lot of people would say that you can't use um, empirical experimentation 
<laughs> to settle questions about ethics because famously you cannot get from get an ought from an is, right? So you can't go from the way the world is to tell you how the how it should be. And similarly, political philosophy um, looks like it draws on empirical information about society and the way it works best and so on, but it doesn't look like that could ever settle the question questions about how you because the question of how to organize society is a question about what you're trying to achieve. Right. right. And science won't tell you what you're trying to achieve. It might help you figure out how to achieve it, but it won't set the goal for you. Uh, it's also not so clear whether or not metaphysical issues like, say, the nature of free will or personal identity over time could be uh, established by uh, empirical investigation. Some people think it's relevant. Some people think it's not. Um Questions and, about and philosophy the, of religion. Aesthetics, for example. Yeah, I mean, really all the value theory stuff. So aesthetics, philosophy of uh, political philosophy and ethics, mm -hmm. that seems pretty clearly non-empirical. It's at least to some, at least partially non-empirical. Mm -hmm. But I actually think that um, probably all areas of, all the main areas of philosophy, you mentioned epistemology, right? Mm -hmm. And epistemology in some ways is prior to science, right? Because it, right. you, 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 it would tell you why you might have good reasons for thinking the deliverances of science should be taken seriously, right? Other than just it works, right? The planes still fly. These planes fly using science. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, now you have to ask an epistemologist or a philosopher of science. So, I mean, um, I think in every case, what you see is that the philosopher and the scientist have something to say to each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you don't you don't really want to be doing political philosophy, for example, without any empirical knowledge about human societies. Sure. That seems like a kind of bad idea to me. And uh, for example, if you're interested in the problem of free will, you might like to know how the brain works, mm -hmm. right? But whether knowing how the brain works will just settle the question of free will, I find implausible. <laughs> Because you also need to engage in some conceptual analysis and clarification of our intuitive concepts there. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you refer to the conceptual framework, and sometimes it's really a matter of clarifying the concepts, because sometimes when we're discussing about free will, uh, it's just a matter of really knowing what we are really talking about because uh, maybe someone is using the term free will to refer to one thing and the other person to refer to another thing. And, and sometimes people, even philosophers, get into disputes that are simply semantic. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I mean, certainly philosophy can um, do a good service by clarifying that kind of thing to stop people from talking past each other. But I think also... Um, that a lot of people have the hope or even the assumption that what philosophy would do in the end is just kind of settle the question. Like, oh, you know, you sort of turn on the nightly news and it says, okay, the philosophers have decided we have free will and here's what it means. And the, I mean, the fact that that's kind of absurd should be a sign that maybe this is not the right way to think about how philosophy works. So I don't, I mean, I think a lot of philosophers certainly think about what they're doing as trying to give the right answer to philosophical questions and defend those answers. And I would say that anyone who's doing that is doing philosophy, but what philosophy as a whole does is kind of explore all the answers you could give and why you might want to give them. So really, like, to take again the question of free will, there are some philosophical reasons to think that we have free will and some philosophical reasons to think that we don't. And it might depend on how you define free will, as you said. Uh, and once you've kind of understood all that, like the different ways it could be defined, the implications of that, the arguments on both sides, da 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 da, da it, once you've understood that as thoroughly as anyone could, you've understood the free will problem. Now, what you might have concluded about free will, what it is and whether we've got it at the end of the day, is another matter. But I don't, I think you could kind of understand everything that can be said on all sides of that issue without sort of having a view and you the, and the, the the fact that you haven't sort of decided how to vote as it were or what conclusion you yourself want to endorse that wouldn't to me mean that you have a lesser philosophical understanding in fact it seems to me the deepest philosophical understanding is the one 
that involves understanding what is to be said on all sides of the issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Dr. Adamson, let's end the interview here. Before we go, so I will be leaving a link in the description box to your podcast. Apart from that, uh, what would be the other places on the internet for people to find your work? Yeah, so um, certainly the website of my podcast, which is historyofphilosophy.net. Um, but you can also subscribe to the podcast on like iTunes or whatever. So usually if you just search for history of philosophy, it will come up. Um, I've also written quite a lot of uh, online articles, for example, for a magazine, philosophy magazine that also appears online called Philosophy Now. Uh, that's another place people could read up on things that I've written. But um, if they go to my website, my podcast website, under links, there's actually a, a list of all the online articles I've done anywhere. So if people have the patience and desire, they can read a lot of what I've said about all this stuff. I'm not sure why they'd want to necessarily, but it's there if they want to. Mm -hmm. You also have a book series associated with the podcast. Yeah, that's right. So the podcast comes out as books. Uh, so the fourth volume is coming out later this year. The fifth volume is coming out next year. So there are already volumes on classical philosophy, later ancient philosophy, philosophy in the Islamic world. Next and this year, um, medieval philosophy will come out. Mm -hmm. Next year, Indian philosophy will come out. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Adamson, uh, Adamson, again, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and to talk with you. And maybe in the future we could do another episode, perhaps in the is about the Islamic world, because it's uh, I've been trying to tackle as many philosophical questions on my show as I can, but there are some very specific niches that not many people are dealing with so yeah well i do have some things to say about that <laughs> so, thanks again for having me on hi there thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end as you might have noticed i've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields so to keep the channel sustainable i would like to ask you to please visit my patreon page and to consider making a pledge there uh, otherwise i also have a paypal and subscribe star and if you like what i'm doing please share it leave a like and hit the subscription button i would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons karen litzke and blanchett perel galarsen lau guerrero chantel Gelinas, francis ford and frederick sunda Brian Ian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, and Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, and Ruth Gervoz, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.